Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the new Lepco Fitness episode, the podcast where we answer your questions. My name is Yal Muhammad, the host of the show, and with me today, we have, as usual, the myth, the legend, the man, Naderman. Joshua Naderman. You know it's really bad when you're your own announcer? I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> Have your own music. Just do your own music as you come in. <laughs> yeah, I'm not saying it's embarrassing, but it is. It's it's fine. Don't worry about it. I'll announce you next time. Uh, I'll, I'll do it next time. So let, let me do that next time, okay? We should get like different, um, we should make up different voices, you know? Like like at one point, uh, just have Morgan Freeman introduce us. <laughs> but it's not really him, but no one will know. You know how you do that, we- right? There's like YouTube guides on it. It's super easy. Okay, interesting. Mm-hmm. Well, we'll check it out later. But for yeah. now, we got to focus on the, the questions. I actually skimmed through them, and boy, you guys got a lot of questions, uh, and uh, I, I love it. So keep sending them in. We'll do our best to answer them. And uh, you know what, Josh? Hmm. Let's just get to it. You know, let's that's, that's not talk around because we got a bunch of questions, and I have had coffee before this. Uh, I I never that's do what that. I'm I. Missing. I, I should never take coffee before a podcast because I never get anything that you know stimulates me like this. So <laughs> anyway, let's get to it. The first question from Nicholas Massman, and he says, "How would you learn the mana with a barbell?" Well, I mean, you you can't really learn the mana with the barbell because you do it on the ground or on parallel bars. I mean, I guess you could do it on a straight bar. I think he's asking how do you use the barbell as a tool I know. to supplement. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, smart ass. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So a lot of that is um, essentially going to be based around shoulder extension movements with the barbell. And um, you kind of have to be a little careful with how you do it. You can teach yourself bad habits, especially with a heavy one. So. I would say that you're better off with like maybe a five pound or 10 pound bar. Even that can be a little much at once because it's just a movement that you're not used to and there's not a lot of muscle mass that's really um, involved in that movement. You know, you're pretty much just reliant on rear delts and Mm -hmm. they're pretty small. No matter how big they get, you take a look at them, it's not that much muscle there. So the, and it doesn't have great leverage. So like the, um, the the issue is that um, people make the mistake, I think, of trying to add a bunch of weight to things instead of learning to move to the correct point in space. Because when you do a mana, what you're really doing is balancing on hands that are stuck to something. And that really changes the equation. It changes the way that your body is able to move things. Just how like a lot of people have trouble getting into a good overhead position in a um, overhead press with a barbell or dumbbells and yet they can hang from a bar with fully open shoulders no problem and a lot of the times they can do a handstand with pretty much fully open shoulders no problem a little bit of guidance but they can do it immediately first day if they're helped properly so Mm -hmm. it's it's a skill thing and it's just not something that is going to be useful to try and you know, spend too much effort building strength in. So you're going to be using lower weights and really focusing on a little bit higher volume of movement and using it as a learning tool. Um, There are better ways for uh, accessory work to be programmed than by just doing a barbell, but it can be really helpful. And it's good for sort of daily um, practice if mana is kind of a high priority. Yeah. 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 I I think that's all to it, honestly. I think that's it. Well mm-hmm. answer, Josh. That's a quick answer. I like I like I like you. All right, <laughs> let's move on to the next question. <laughs> let's do it. I'm just used to these huge answers, but this is good. Let's not, I like, we'll I see. like hey, how don't, this podcast is going. Don't don't break not, the magic, I'm, I'm, man. It's I'm the not moment. gonna jinx it, bro. Let's see what happens. I'm not gonna jinx it. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah, we'll see. We're good. We'll see. We're good. Next question. Simon Hernandez, okay? Mm-hmm. He says, Hey guys, I'm trying to make sense of volume waves for hypertrophy. If you plan a 5% volume increase per week and try to aim up to 130 to 150% in total by the end of your cycle, you end up adding a ton of volume and time on the last week, considering that you need actual volume for each muscle group. Are my assumptions correct or am I you know, doing something wrong with my equation in my head? 
I you want to tackle saying. that first? Yeah, sure. I think I think it's a, it's a it's not much off with what I'm doing. I'm also increasing that much volume, and uh, yeah, if you're increasing volume, yeah, it will take much longer time to do it, and be smart about it. Listen to your body. Can you handle it? If you can, keep doing it. Is what I think, Josh. So I agree that um, if you're asking me, like, is his math correct and is doing that going to add a crap ton of time to your workouts? Yeah, yeah, it will. I think the better question is, do you need to add that much volume that quickly? And the answer is no. Okay. Um, so there's this range where I'm trying to think of like something quick to. So if you watch Doctor uh, Mike Isratel's stuff you'll see that he references a couple of things. He actually coined some of these terms, and uh, they're very good terms. They're, they're things that have been mentioned for a long time, but have never really been kind of um, properly defined and differentiated. So you have what you call a maximum recoverable volume, which is mm. the, your balance point. If you do any more than that, you are going to be breaking down instead of maintaining. Notice I did not say instead of building up, okay? So... Well, what gonna, do you mean with breaking down? I'm gonna show you. I'm, the, I'm, I'm drawing something right now that I think, this is not kind of how he represents it, but this is a spectrum that I think really puts things in perspective. Okay. And... and uh, Let's if see. you can take a picture of that later on, I'll put it in the podcast article. Uh, yeah, you'll, you'll definitely want to do this better than I'm doing it, it you know, with some colors <laughs> and like actual graphics. <laughs> but this will help people for the moment. So um, the and then let's see. All right. This is kind of spaced out a bit. Okay showing Yad because he's on a different camera angle. Yeah, so, but you gotta you gotta stop your screen share so I can see it. Oh, good call. Yeah. Man. Or not open up used the visor. To the Discord. Yeah, yeah. Um just, just open up the visor and I can see it too that way. Yeah, but I shouldn't be wasting bandwidth on the uh sure. screen share. Where the hell did I put my Discord? I don't It's right there. Oh, how do I stop the uh, more screen share options? Stop sharing your screen. All right. Now you got to share your screen, though. Oh, yeah. There we go. There oh, is it, it working? Is. I see it. Yes, okay. Sir. So I'm showing you that. So now you can see how I have these different letters there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So from left to right, this is more volume to less volume. And mm -hmm. let me pull my um, smartphone mirror app up so that I can kind of see where I've got this. It's a little bit overbalanced, but... What what we want to see there is so on the left you see uh, MMV. What that means is minimum maintenance volume. You can do less than this, but doing less than that is not going to keep you where you're at. Then you have this gap between minimum maintenance volume and minimum effective volume. And what minimum effective volume means is this is the minimum you have to do to make some kind of progress from where you're at. Then there's this huge gap, and you get to this acronym MAV. That's your maximum adaptive volume. In other words, that's the point where you will have your best gains. Notice that that is not as much volume as your maximum recoverable volume. I really want, I, I, that cannot be overstated. That's very <clears throat> important. People usually push themselves until they break down, and, um, they, there's a reason for that, and it gets into the question a little bit. So I'm sorry that this is a little bit of a longer answer. There That's is really, fine. especially, there are, as you become more and more and more and more and more advanced, some people will say that you cannot avoid running into your maximum recoverable volume if you are doing your workouts um I don't want to say correctly, but if you're going to make sure that you get what you need. That's a very brute force approach to things, and it, it definitely can work. It just You just have to have a good coach who's getting a lot of feedback from you and is taking a close inventory of your performance. Because what happens is when you get to that MRV, you typically go past it, and that means you're in the breakdown zone. 
And that's a bad place to be. And the longer you spend there, the more you're likely to get hurt. So yeah. you know, what you really want to be doing is spending some time moving from the minimum effective volume, especially when you first start off, slowly building up to your maximum adaptive volume. And then what you want to be doing is really kind of staying close to that. And that maximum adaptive volume really only changes by like one or two reps per week. So okay, can I ask something yeah. real, real fast? Uh, how do you know where you, you're well, at? That's very difficult. Um, yeah. You know if you're moving forward. And you know if you are not feeling more fatigued at the beginning of each workout. Um, does that make sense? So there are actually so you, more so scientific you mean, ways. You can you can track uh, resting heart rate. You can track like temperature at 6 in the morning. There's a lot of things you can do. That you re that requires special equipment and it's it's very um, obsessive compulsive, and okay. so it is useful for a competitive athlete who is actually in the running for a world title or believes that they have the capability to get there and is with a coach that knows how to use these tools and that stress is not on them to do for themselves. I do not think it's in any way productive for somebody who is working out on their own. Or for somebody who is basically not in that situation, if you're not in the position to be making, uh, you know, millions of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars off of the efforts that you're putting into your body, then I think that you're uh, doing something that's bad for you if you try to take all that stuff into account, you know. Okay. Uh, there are people who will disagree and say, well, you know what, I just want to be the best I can be. And that's fine. There are people who don't fall into that general advice category. They accept the fact that they're going to be under more stress and other areas of their life are going to suffer. And they will. Uh, you'll be more irritable more of the time. You will not have the energy to put into your personal relationships. And if those aren't a priority, then that's cool. You just have to know that there are trade-offs with it all, you know. So for the general person who just wants to have like a good productive life, I don't think it's a good idea. I think the best idea is to say that, you know, from year to year, my maximum adaptive volume is probably going to increase a bit. And so is my maximum recoverable volume. And so is my uh, minimum effective volume. And probably so is my maintenance volume. And so... Okay. Uh, you just have to realize that these things don't change a huge amount from year to year. You're not going to double it. It's like if you need, uh, we'll say, um, you know, five sets of, you know, 10 reps this week, just as a random choice, you probably don't need more than five sets of 11 reps next week. Um, yeah. You know what I mean? Like some will say you may even need less than that. Um, it's very hard to say. I think that especially when you know that you're close, you may want to slow down the uh, the volume gain. But the advantage of the way that we try to do things is we don't run the cycles so long that you run the risk of going into severe volume overload where you start down on a downswing. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so we provide a reset that lets us go basically from... Y you will end up like a little bit past the uh, adaptive, the maximum adaptive volume, but you're still in an adaptive zone. You're still making gains, right? Because there's no way, there's no magic number that's um, absolutely MAV. That doesn't exist right now. Machine learning will get us there, but yeah, yeah, yeah. The um, you know, that's a that's something that takes a long time to develop, and um, the uh, I, I think. I think I think you uh, you you answered that question pretty well, man. You, you, but you know what I'm saying. So I, think I know what you're saying. Yeah. You also have to ask yourself, what's this five percent volume per week, and why did I pick that? What does that even mean? You know, a five percent volume per week or a five percent intensity per week—that's a recovery from a time off. That is not mm -hmm. in any way a sustainable approach to working out. It's too much. Um, like if you look at what, you, you know what I mean, like. Uh, and, and I say that, it also depends on how you do it. Because we do rest pause, it's a lot less stress on the tissues. And so you don't run into these, uh, it really does change the equation. Okay, and, okay. No, and that's, that, that's actually a very important point. Yeah, point. like, so when people try, like, just imagine if you were trying to do all of those reps as straight sets. You would get hurt. Insane. It wouldn't happen. I can't seen, even do that. 
Not it's not, like- yeah, it's, it's physically not possible. Nobody in the history of ever, even on steroids, has been able to literally consistently add, and, and I don't mean when they first get started, but I mean, yeah, if they, yeah. if you know what I mean, but when when they get to where, okay, they're, because uh, that does happen for newbie gains or for people who start juicing or whatever. Yeah. But as you get to where, okay, now your body is back close to its carrying capacity and sort of in that linear gain zone again, um, you're, you got limits. You just can't do more than a certain amount. And you're not going to literally double the weights that you, you the, the number of reps you can do in a row without rest uh in four weeks like if you start doing four reps of 400 pounds on something you're not going to do eight reps of 400 pounds in a month unless you have made a radical change in your intensity so that you have a a neural adaptation available to you right so like uh if if you were doing 15 reps and then you drop down to 10 reps you're going to see it's going to be a lot easier to add the volume because your body is getting more efficient you have more strength you're actually lower down in your intensity than you think you are and so there's a different approach to that kind of a cycle. And uh, the, so kind of the point is that you should 150% increase in your training volume over like six weeks or something is insane. 150%. I'm just like doing math here. And I'm like, man, how long would your cycle have to be to do 150% training volume increase? I mean, that would have to be 26 weeks, I think. So half a year. That is a very, very long time to use the same weight. And it's not really appropriate unless you only have 25-pound plates available to you. Yeah. And then, then you just got to do what you got to do. Yeah, dude, Dan John has run programs with rundown teams who have no equipment, only have like 45s and 25s. And that's the kind of stuff they had to do. They just kept adding reps. And then, you know, a couple times a year you added weight, and that's fine. But that's an adaptation to a suboptimal situation. When you've got the tools, you're better off running like a 6- to 12-week cycle, depending on where you're at and what you're trying to do, and then resetting, you know? And and that's something that, you know, we'll be providing more guidance on, but that's a... That's a seminar topic all by itself, just talking about those things, you know? You could go for at least a full day. But we can now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, which is why I'm trying to rein it in. But it's like that's so, a big, so, big question, you know? There's yeah, a lot think, you have to know. We, even even to develop gave, good tools, it's hard to – that's hard. You have to know yeah. an awful lot about the parameters that go in and the physiology that happens uh, with um, so-called overtraining and whatnot. Okay. All right, man. Let's move on to the next one. Mm-hmm. Good question. Good answer. <laughs> anyway, moving on to the next question by Alexander Igabuk. Igabak. Mm-hmm. <sighs> My pronunciation is sounds I was gonna so say, American, yeah, I don't actually I know how to say his name either. I need to ask I don't him. Know. Anyways. Anyway, I think, yeah. He says, when would one add resistance to an exercise over adding more volume? Or the other way around, for maximum muscle mass gains. So when do you make that switch from, okay, not volume, now let's add resistance? I mean, from a practical level, I would just say either when your cycle ends, um, you obviously need to retest because you've been Mm -hmm. adding volume and it's time. Or if you don't have a a definite end date, if you say, you know, I'm just going to take this until I kind of, I, I just feel like I'm doing too much. Um, Some people will do that. I don't really recommend that. But there's people who are going to do it anyways. So mm-hmm. in that situation, you do it when you feel like the volume's too much. You reset, you retest, and then you find your new weight to start at the bottom of your chosen rep range. So if you like to work from 10 to 17 reps or whatever, then when you get up in that 16, 17 rep range, I mean, it's time for you to retest, plain and simple. Yeah. Every, simple. You know? Yeah, absolutely. It's very sim- yeah, but that's, that's how I do it. So that's... Mm-hmm. It's a That's, very the yeah. nice thing about that is that you don't run too long. You don't run into the situation of just piling volume until you feel it, and so you don't. Yeah, run but you as also have you also risk. have a you also have a natural deload. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. what I'm getting at. Exactly. Yeah. So you have yeah. like a natural deload in your cycles without even consciously deciding on a deload. It's just right. happening because it's right. the end of your cycle. And that's right. how our programs are sort of. Right. Uh, and and that's why you don't have to. Yeah, because if you look at it. 
and you take into account all the rest pause reps and all of that stuff and you say crap i started doing 50 reps i ended doing 75 reps which is about a 50 percent volume increase which is a pretty large increase to be doing over the course of five or six weeks um, but mm-hmm. it doesn't cause anywhere near as much damage because of the rest between reps. And that has exactly. to do with engineering concepts like creep and strain, um, which may not make sense to too many people, but they're fun to read about. So uh, plastic versus elastic deformation, which is really where creep comes in, understanding it's the plastic part. Uh, anyways, happens to everything. So what you need to know is just that when you when you have these cycles that are run long enough to allow a meaningful volume increase and to use the same resistance range and to not take too much of your time, but you know enough to where you're in there, you're getting good work, you're getting the volume that you need for good growth, and you're not going into a danger zone, and then you reset. It also gives you the opportunity to safely move into a new kind of cycle. You know, yeah. so you run a couple of mass cycles and you start doing. Uh, some strength stuff. There is some transitioning that can happen between there. Some people, that's all they need for a couple of years. Certain athletes may need power. Totally different. Drives people crazy because the real power cycle is boring. But, Mm -hmm. um, oh yeah, you're, dude, you, so power cycle, people don't get it. You know, power cycle means that as soon as you have slowed down to 95% of your original speed, you stop. You're done for the day. So, It is low oh, rep. Oh, that is boring as hell. Then well, you, you have don't... to have long reps. You're doing maybe three reps, three to four reps at most, but they're explosive yeah. reps. They take like a second each, and then you're taking a minute to five minutes of rest, sometimes more. And then because you have to be at max speed, power is pure neurological adaptation. So, and it's adaptation to <laughs> rapid rate of force development. And so you have to be very sports specific with it. You have to put a lot of, you have to really know a lot about what you're doing and the danger that comes with that because the peak forces are higher than your body's used to believe it or not even though the total impulse is less those words probably don't mean a lot to people but it's amount of total energy input which is going to get okay. into different types of damage and you know as you look at in and also different types of adaptation and so you you look at these things and there's just a lot you have to know to do it right and it's why most people don't so sort of reeling that in programming wise the reason we do what we do is that a we know it works it's super easy it goes with the physiology of how bodies work fairly well without having to be overly complicated or require a whole lot from the person doing the workout and so you're actually getting a lot more than you think you are and you're doing it in a way that just doesn't wear you down as much and that's uh that's very important you know, you have to mm-hmm, recognize mm-hmm. that and then uh, personalize <clears throat> the volume. And that's, you know, that's All stuff right. that comes with time and experience. Yeah, cool. Mm-hmm. Off to the next question. Gonzalo Martins. He asks, first of all, one of our articles and one of our job with the website content, guys. I love it. Well, we love you, dude. We, we love you. <laughs> anyway, uh, oh. let's see. I think I can answer this question. It's... Uh, what? Oh, I was like, what the hell are you doing? Dude, that <laughs> was Darth Vader. Vader. He was buttoning in. That's pretty yeah. cool, man. Anyway, I'll answer this question. You can continue drinking your coffee. He says, regarding the skill section on the lap, uh, that can be adjusted accordingly to the athlete goals, right? If someone wants to work on side lever and back lever, that can be the focus for the skill. Or is there a reason behind the selection for the current skills? Okay, so Cole and I decided on the current skills because those are the most popular and they tend to translate very well to any other skill but if you want to do a side lever and back lever that is fine um but bear in mind always always think back yo am i doing too much or not you know always constantly monitor yourself because you're doing it you're doing a mass cycle right now skill shouldn't be your primary focus you should be focusing on getting bigger so your basic strength is on the forefront uh so but if you want to do some side lever work and back lever work that's fine just don't get injured please that's yeah. basically my answer no, I like that. Um, you can definitely personalize it. You do not have to. And, and, you know, it takes time to get these options in place. Yes. But, but here's the it thing. Really does. So, yeah. There's going to be a strength cycle after, after these two mass cycles. And then we'll have a skill cycle. And by the time we're there, 
uh, I'm sure we have much more information, like much more content yeah. on those skills. But it's, yeah. it's a matter of time. We need to get there first. Well, before the we thing can... too is that you know with the strength, the strength cycle has a lot less volume and actually causes a lot less damage. So we have room for more, and it's it. In a lot of ways, it takes less time too. So there's more room for people to do more skill work. When you're trying to get thinking, big, yeah. you're basically inflamed all the time. I mean, that's what drives the growth. So you're not going to be in a good position to do a lot of super hard flexibility and uh, you know mobility oriented skills, and you're also not going to be in a good position to do high tension skills. So your best bet to, there is yeah. to kind of just ru- keep practicing. Don't push too hard, and just so it does require a little bit of uh insight into how you feel but for the most yeah. part you we've got some we should anyways uh, have some uh basic guidelines for not going over a certain amount of volume during a math cycle yes and, we do we do yeah and that's as long as you pay attention to those you're not going to lose anything that you've gained and that's the no, goal but also also to put it in a perspective a lot of times you'll do better but the, the point is that as soon as you switch out of the mass cycle and start the strength cycle, like immediately gains start happening. And then when you go yes. into the skills cycle, now we've we've totally changed where volume is distributed. And all of a sudden you're like, oh my, oh my God, well, this is just getting so much better from week to week. I don't understand. And then you, the, the guidance there is like, you need to listen to us when you tell, when we tell you to stop because you're going to do too yeah. much because you're going to be super happy. And okay, to put to put that, in perspective, let me let me let Yad me dive knows. in. Yeah, just live this. <laughs> okay, okay. To put in perspective, guys. Okay, so when you do a mass cycle, the first thing, <laughs> the first thing to know is, just to put in perspective, Olaf sent me a uh, like uh, sent us in the group chat a uh, message like, hey, yo, guys, I can't even spend time on skill anymore because I can't even get into a proper advanced tuck planche. And this guy, he has proper shell planches. Okay. Mm-hmm. And we, we just said, don't worry about it. <laughs> don't worry about it. Because that's At 102 what happens kilos. I just want to put that out there. At 102 kilos. He's okay? massive. He's a monster. But anyway, to get back to the point, I myself, for example, I have had a full Maltese on rings, a Victorian even. There's no way I'm doing that now. I'm in a mass cycle, okay? And I'm not going to cry about it because I know what's going to happen after this. After this, I'll do a shrink cycle, just like you guys are. And during the strength cycle, I will introduce more skill because I will have more energy for that. And during the skill skill cycle, you'll probably see me do crazy stuff, stuff that I I can't even bear to imagine what's going to happen in the skill cycle. So just see the skill cycle as unwrapping, unwrapping all the games you work for. It's like, mm-hmm. oh shit, is this what I've been doing? That's the skill cycle. Yeah, for you Dragon so, Ball Z fans, it's like going into the hyperbolic time chamber. And then getting touched by the elder Namek, like yes, that's that's <laughs> what it's like. And you, uh, you <laughs> unlike and, Dragon and- Ball Z characters, <laughs> you are breakable. So if you, Yad has done yep. this probably two or three times, where <laughs> he's just doing so much more, and he's like, oh my god, like I can sleep and plunge. I don't understand. I'm just gonna <laughs> plunge like to twelve say. times a day, and then yes. you know. Uh, and then Josh crazy, is like, though. dude, stop it. I was like, yo, bro, I'm full pledged everywhere now. <laughs> yeah, and then I get like this video and you know, you're in there with Hassan and Yuri and you're like doing a um a surprising for your first attempt at it, it was like so he did do an Azarian Maltese. Like he literally just rolled did a backwards roll and ended up in a Maltese. And yeah. he surprised himself because he didn't know it was gonna happen, and it's a really funny video. And um it was like don't Thank you so many Instagram. Like, oh, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> you're not your arms aren't ready like i know you're strong enough but bro we haven't gotten there yet <laughs> i was so sore for weeks but i was satisfied but I was that's like, what okay, happens enough now yeah. enough you you've you're very strong we get it now go back to your mass cycle <laughs> like yeah because we, we had need a, more we had a glimpse yeah we had a glimpse of what's there now so let's go back Let's go back to the workstation. Let's, right. let's work on your body again. Right. Like, we want to be where we're repping Van Gelders. We want to be where we're doing Olympic routines because that's, you know, that's a goal that Yad has. And so we're very specific to it. And mm-hmm. we, we're not looking at what's going to look cool in August. We're thinking about 2024. And when you have long-term goals that involve very hard things, it really it benefits you a lot to take that kind of approach. You know, and it actually benefits your short term stuff too. That's the funny thing. Like, people think, oh, well, I, you know, whatever. I just want to, and 
the thing is, is that even if you do just want to, it's still going to work out better if you take a smart approach to it. Yep. You know? You got to be patient, though, guys. Patience yeah. is key. Yep. Moving on to the next question by Vincent Dutret. I think it's a French uh, name, so that's why it's pronounced like that. <laughs> and he says, oh, this is a question for you, Josh. He mm. says, what are the general guidelines to follow when dealing with elderly folks looking to train? Both my parents are in their 60s and are relatively healthy, but I'm worried mm -hmm. about what will remain of their autonomy in the upcoming decades, especially since science seems to point out that not only cardiovascular health is important to what? longevity. That's horseshit. What, what are you talking that about? That is when, total falsehood. What, what do you mean? The science points out that only cardiovascular health... No, no, that's... no, no. He says that not only cardiovascular health is important to learn oh, okay i just heard that i was like whoa it's like also muscle the mass on. and strength tradition no 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 this guy's on your side calm down yeah no no he says you need muscle he says that's also important so believe it or not muscle mass is not well correlated with uh longevity you know what is muscle power what? well it's oh okay. so what how would you i'm gonna put it like this before i explain it <coughs> If you're strong enough to catch yourself during a fall, but you're not fast enough to grab a bar or get your foot where it needs to go, did that strength mean anything? Damn, the answer is like... no, because you still <laughs> fell and your hip still broke. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> That's like a old wise saying. Yeah. Modernized. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm becoming old. I'm not wise yet, but you know, I'm just copying <laughs> smart people. Yeah. But seriously, well, the, that's really what it comes down to is that, yeah, you do. So the muscle mass helps. So the things that the muscle mass really helps is kind of blood glucose control. It really does help diabetics. Um, having more protein in the diet does help diabetics. There's a lot of things out there that, you know, as you get older and these diseases that are associated with aging um, are... There are a lot of benefits, cognition stuff. Uh, there, there's, you know, you can go through quite a list but mm -hmm. the the big thing is that you definitely want to be doing strength training. Traditional strength training is fantastic because old muscle, as long as it's fed properly, responds almost identically to young muscle to resistance training in terms of both strength and mass gains. Those are the two things that set you up for increased muscle power. But power, again, just like I answered in this this previous question, power is a pure neurological phenomenon. It is how your body recruits the muscle you have. And so that means training rapid contraction with lighter weight. And so you have to start that slowly. So for example, the way that this would transition for an old person would be we would start with a typical kind of learning tempo two or three seconds up and down we want them to learn how to move well eventually won't we want them to have a fast concentric and a uh, controlled eccentric for their strength and mass training and then as we go into a power cycle we really want them to have we want to move okay now we're doing a two second eccentric now one and a half now one now half a second and we want to get them eventually to where just like us they with a lighter weight they can right Party. No, yeah 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 you want them to be able to do rapid leg extensions you want them to be able to do rapid leg curls you want them to be able to do rapid knee raises you want them to be able to do good paced um uh you know split squats and stuff and the uh you know leg presses are a great exercise for stuff like that especially for the power things for old people because it takes a lot of the risk out when it's done right but, um, and the other thing with older people you have to think about is that as you do this, a lot of people have arterial plaque buildups and aneurysms and stuff, which are just balloons in the uh, veins that are weaker spots, <coughs> really it's the arteries, whatever, um, that have uh, <coughs> potential for rupture and increased pressure causes stretch and increased force, which promotes rupture. So to prevent that, uh, in general, you want to do one arm at a time, one leg at a time. And that doesn't mean just doing a split squat. It literally means doing like a one leg leg press. It means doing a one leg, uh, or sorry, <laughs> one arm like machine press uh, or dumbbell press, in, you know, for uh, 
a lot of the exercise, especially if they have high blood pressure or if there is a history of brain aneurysm or um, cardiovascular disease, just because you're going to basically get the same amount of work done in the workout. It might take a couple minutes more, but not really much more than that. Yeah. And y- your blood pressure rises a lot less, which means that the vessels stretch less, means less force is placed on weakened areas. And you just have a much lower incidence of uh, catastrophic events. And to me, for such a simple alteration for old people, um, that's just a smart thing to do. I mean, when I was working in cardiac rehab, uh, you know, they that's not always how we did things. But um, that's one of the things that I would definitely introduce these days if that was still my environment is that, you know, we do That's want to smart. be able to lift certain things, but as we, as our strength starts going up and we start getting to where I can tell you really like straining, I want to get a good bit of your volume into the one arm and one leg at a time stuff so that we protect you. You know what I mean? Like that's just how I yeah, see yeah, it. Yeah. But those would be no, the things that I would do. Yeah. That's the point. I, I, to- I would have never mm-hmm. come up with that. So that's the actually... nutrition, the nutrition. mass, right? And the nutrition, the key there is to make sure they're getting at least 30 grams of protein in a serving. And mm-hmm. at least a couple times a day because that gives them at least three grams of leucine. They're leucine insensitive. You can also do, uh, especially as they get into their 70s and beyond, it may help to actually use a specific leucine supplement to where you take like uh, five milliliters of leucine powder and mm-hmm. just mix it in with their protein. Don't do it after you do the shake. Take the dry protein powder and the leucine powder, mix them together and, you know, <laughs> like in the shaker while it's dry. And then add your liquid and shake it up. And that makes things super easy. Uh, it'll mix great. It, th- that'll be your best way to do it. And what that does is it just follows uh, research-driven guidelines that ensure their muscle mass responds as well as it can so that they get okay. the most out of their training. There are other things you can do, but I'm not going to talk about them here because they do get into some medical advice that I would give to people in clinic, but I wouldn't say randomly. Uh, it goes outside of medical education, I think, and into advice, and I'm not going there for random people I don't know. Yeah, I get but it. That's, those are the big th- things. If you just do that, yeah. you are off to a fantastic start. Great. Yeah. Awesome. All right, let's move on to the next one. Mm-hmm. Uh, Robert Burchell, I think. Uh, it po- Okay, so he's, he's asking – oh, these are actually two questions I found that are very similar, so mm-hmm. I paired them. So first, Robert, he says um, – do you guys have any tips on TFCC strains and forearm splints? And the other guy, Demetrius Manuris, asks, what is the mechanism behind forearm splints and how, how do you get rid of them for planche? So forearm splints for both of them, basically. Uh, any tips on that? So I think they're talking about compartment syndrome, um, like low-level, subchronic uh subchronic, is subacute. That- okay, so compartment syndrome, you have acute and you have chronic. Um mm-hmm. So the acute is what we typically talk about in med school, and it's the life-threatening thing or limb-threatening thing it, because you, you, you have so much pressure. So the way that the forearm and the uh, lower leg, technically the leg, because the upper leg is called the thigh anatomically, but mm-hmm. and the leg is everything below the knee. But anyways, so your forearm has an anterior and a posterior compartment. And you know as it comes through here, that tissue, it's mostly bone here. So there's very compared to all of the uh, of the fluid capacity you have here, there's not a lot of fluid capacity that can pass through this. You just yeah. have a couple of uh, communicating veins, and that's that's about it. Most of it is kind of connective tissue space, and all this is wrapped up in thick connective tissue, right? The fascia, and so yeah. uh, as the as the muscles swell. Um, if, if you do so much damage to them that they remain swollen and don't completely swell out, like unswell, over time you can get increased fluid buildup in those, in those muscles to where they never completely get back to normal. And you'll always be a little tight there, and they'll always hurt. Um, forearm splints is also kind of a weird term. So I don't really know what they mean or where because you have a lot of muscles. Well, I think I – think, so – you know what I remember mean? Remember when I had when remember when I had the the issue here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This one, I that this actually an issue that a lot of, a lot of athletes I uh, noticed that ha- that do planche have yeah. had. Yeah, everybody's worried I about think, their biceps, but actually their forearm flexors end up being a big problem. Yes, it's it, I can almost everyone who has been doing planche has come to me with this problem, 
with, but mm-hmm. the pain here. Yeah. I've had it a few times in my career, and the way I basically solved it is with a few things. So first thing, the compression thing you were talking yes. about. So you get a you get the yeah. wrap, you, and you compress. Right. That's where uh, your yeah. forearm. You hold it for five to ten minutes. It, hurt, it hurts like a bitch, but you, you get used to it after like yeah. the third uh, third time. You get used to the pain. Here. Yeah, there was this I whole craze a couple of years actually, ago. I'll, yeah, just show what they are. Actually, real actually quick. You, you you go ahead, you talk, and then I'll get them. Yeah, real fast. So what Yad is talking about is um, this thing that was started up. Uh, I don't know who else was involved with it, but I first heard about it from Kelly Starrett, who does not have my favorite approach on a lot of things, and his explanations that he puts publicly are largely terrible. Um, but it gets people doing things, and I guess that matters a lot. Um, I hate I hate how that sounds like I'm ragging. I guess I kind of am, but what did you say? He's done a lot of good. I, I was just talking about how like a lot of this came from uh, like the the compression, at least my awareness of the elastic bands that for, for that we're going to show came from Kelly Starrett, uh, the whole supple leopard dude, which mm-hmm. I I'm not a huge fan of his explanations because a lot of them are flat out wrong, and I can guarantee you that he could give the completely correct explanation if we asked him. But he understands that normal people won't get it and so it's a uh you know it's it's a love hate thing like he gets people doing things that a lot of times will be helpful unfortunately the way that it gets portrayed people do too much uh they get cause crush injuries on themselves but anyways that's not really going to happen with these wraps so what these wraps do is you start from the wrist and then you wrap towards the elbow so that you create a pressure gradient it's like compression stockings for diabetics or people who have uh, uh a lot of fluid in their legs we're literally yeah. wringing them like out. I'm doing it's right like, now. Yeah, you think of it if your if your forearm was a towel full of water, we're squeezing the water out up into your shoulder and into your body. Yeah. That's what we're doing. And so it, it takes time because you're squeezing through these lymphatic channels, and um, so you just got to need to do it for like five to ten minutes. Yeah, exactly. Do you think longer is necessary? I wouldn't. Or so useful? here's the thing. We know that 10 minutes is safe. Like, and when you do arm surgery, you can cut circulation off to the arm for like an hour and a half. Yeah, um, one and a half hours. And, and nothing will, no, no long-term damage will happen. But um, people are stupid and uh, to be, <laughs> seriously, it also, that's, mean? that's, a, there are absolutely people who will like, they'll say, well, I know this is going to be uncomfortable, so I'm going to wrap my arm for, you know, 45 minutes or an hour or something, and then I'm going to just take a nap because I don't want to deal with this for oh, an hour. And then no they're going to wake way. up four hours later, and they're not going to have a hand the next week. So there, don't I do just, that, guys. I just, I just can't bring my – so, like, you know, you, you have to do this when you're going to stay awake. I'm not going to tell you that, yes, this is the right thing for you, but I will tell you that as a general uh, educational approach to things, for educational purposes only, you do this. It is This is not a prescription for you. you okay, know? but just, just so but, people... But it, but it works, it and, like. and it, for 10 minutes, it's safe, for sure. Um, yeah. The uh, you know Unless you have a clotting disorder. If you have a clotting well. disorder or a bleeding disorder, then uh, it's not. You'll probably know if you have that. If you're old enough to train and you have internet access and you have medical care, then you should know. Um, and if you're not sure, just ask your doctor. They'll interview you, and then you'll know. So Okay. Yeah, and anyways. Anyway, just quickly to go back to what I first, did. First, yeah, squeeze yeah, the fluid so out, and then? Squeeze it out, and then for 10 minutes, and then you can take it off. Look at how high Yad wrapped that. That's very yeah. important. Let me do that again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because you got to realize that these muscles attach to your upper arm. So yeah, you got you got to almost go over your elbow. Maybe yeah, even go over it. If, if you can, you want to go halfway up the bicep, but yeah. that's very hard to do for yourself. The big thing is to go past the elbow. As long as you do that, you're good. See you want to get on top of the bony points. As long as you get to those uh, humeral epicondyles, then you know yep. you're in reasonably good shape. Anyway, I did though I did that for like two times a day, one in the morning, one in the evening. Mm-hmm. And an exercise that Josh actually showed me that helped immensely. I don't know if you even remember this, Josh, but this I is an know. excellent exercise. Anyway, the exercise is very simple. I'll stand up actually and show you guys. So what you do is you hold a bar or anything with weight around here. And what you want to do is I can't actually well, there's the bed in the in a way, but yeah, yeah. You're doing ulnar deviation. 
Yeah, basically all their deviation work. Yeah. Yeah, just look. It's a that fancy way like, of saying that you bend your pinky towards the outside of your elbow, but like your hand, not your finger. And mm-hmm. that's it. So you just, the, the key with a lot of those exercises is to feel the muscle tension, but not try to push as far as you can with the range because you can actually impinge tissues in your wrist and it can hurt a lot. Yes, yes. Like, but actually, I, I do a high rep of that, basically. Yeah. yeah. Not not high intensity, just, just right. you know, 25, 30 reps. It should be doable. You feel a little burn here. You should yeah. feel the burn at the place where it actually hurts most. Yeah. And I also do some grip work. Also mm-hmm. seems to help. Extension yep. work. Yep. And uh, that fixed me up real good. I don't yep. have any issues at all. Yep. And then so another everything. thing that can help people a lot is the self-myofascial release. I don't know if you remember us running you through that. We'll With have the, to do a separate uh, video. The cross ball? Yeah. There's not a great setup to show people that right now. But um, yeah. as we move forward... For staying comfortable come. and managing, it will come. Yeah. All right. Let's move on to the next one. To the next question by Daniel Manu. He asks, how would you train the trans- transverse abdominis? I personally have a quite, sh- I personally have quite strong abs since I can remember, and they were never a weak link when training skills. So, so why do you want to train them? <laughs> yeah, this is a because- weird question <laughs> to me because, um, well, okay. So here's the thing. I think it's a very I think it's a question that when people stop and hear it and think about it, they'll say, yeah, how come? How? Because everybody makes a big deal about this one muscle. And what you have to realize is that what that muscle does is provide abdominal compression. It's a belt. And it it is a horizontal belt. Your obliques are a diagonal belt. Your rectus abdominis is a vertical belt. These three belts are supposed to work together. So there's not a special exercise that you're supposed to do unless you want to, to say isolate. that yeah you you don't want to isolate that muscle because a it's very hard to and b you'll teach yourself things that actually screw up like there's actually one of the things i saw on the form check forum that um i haven't had a chance to really get into because i need to sort of you know i think we're talking about doing that as like a case series but yeah 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 by the way move on yeah yeah you know it's uh if you notice, he actually sucks his stomach in as he goes down past a person. And that's part of his form problem right there. You, sucking okay. your stomach in is not the answer. You're supposed to be trying to push a poop out. That's like, I mean, I, I understand that, you know, people don't want to poop in the gym. And I don't want you to poop in the gym unless it's on the <laughs> toilet. Um, and it's clean. You should wash those. Gym toilets are nasty. But, yeah, yeah, there's a chance I've been there. And you should bring a mask. <laughs> but... <laughs> All right, yes. No, the thing is, is that, you know, proper bracing of the core is going to activate all of those muscles and they're going to remain active during everything that you do. So that's actually the best way to do them. So like McGill's sit-ups done properly are an excellent, excellent, excellent exercise. They actually show more activation of both the transverse abdominis and the internal obliques and the external obliques and the rectus abdominis than any other single exercise. So, like, I'm not sitting here making random recu- recommendations because I think that the inside of Dr. McGill's butthole is especially delicious. I think that it's because he does the best stuff out there. Uh, he has routinely brought world-class athletes out of retirement and into new record zones while they still have active injuries, and yet they remain pain-free and don't get new injuries. So, uh, you know, it's... Sounds it's not- like a great guy. He's a pretty good dude. He's done a hell of a service to the entire world of fitness and is not really well recognized for it. Um, and, uh, you know, my goal is just to te- is not to teach you guys history. It's to make sure that you have the best tools available and that you understand how to do them correctly, how to use mm-hmm. them correctly. But that's how I would do it. And then as you learn, because the thing is that the McGill setup is not just a great basic strength trainer. It's also a great skill trainer because that skill for core compression um, and it's not in the gymnastic sense where you're thinking of piking. It's compression, abdominal compression in the sense of you are bracing a neutral spine so that it can't move. The, yeah. uh, you know, and or that it can move, but very slowly under specific conditions. Those are kind of the key elements of doing like side lever lifts, of doing a good, you know, dragon flag lift or body lever lift or whatever you want to call it. Those are the keys to almost everything that you ever do, and the um, you know the the really even to a certain extent it actually helps 
uh, you know, with handstand presses and stuff. So you, you, it's just a question of getting away from these ideas of abdominal muscle isolation and instead just learning to use your core correctly, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that, that's how I would say and when you've been doing things well and you're already really strong, you don't need to isolate that. You're obviously doing fine. Um, now, if you have a deficiency and you're like, crap, I can't squat right, my backgrounds and this and that and my deadlifts suck, then we need to troubleshoot your stances and get you into a place where you're able to move properly and then teach you. But it's not a fundamental strength problem. It's probably just you don't actually know how to do those movements right, so we teach you and then you're good. Cool. All right. Moving on to the next question by Yuri von Hook, who is actually uh, in the first That's year of cool medicine. Name. He was, yeah, he's in the first year of medicine. He was my, uh, one of my co-students. Okay. So hi. Hi, Yuri. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually train with him sometimes in gymnastics. So uh, he told me, yo, Yacht, make sure to answer this question. Well, we answer all of them. So anyway, his uh, question is concerning deloading. Obviously, this comes down to your body and your awareness of fatigue and overtraining. Nevertheless, could you provide some general guidelines on approaching it? Because, because generally, you'll find a recommendation of doing it once every four to six weeks. But they seem to be based mostly on logistic ease rather than research. Thank you. Um, I think so, there's a lot of truth to that statement. Um, yeah. I think that you make a much bigger mistake... Uh, trying to just dial in the ultimate perfect moment to deload because you run the risk of missing it and you're also just wasting a lot of mental energy looking for it. You're better off running a smart cycle that takes you through a good period of gains, you know, six to 12 Don't weeks look for, for that most edge, people. Basically. Right, right. Once you've done things and you're like, you know what, I'm still doing well, but my volume's kind of high now. It doesn't bother me, but geez, it's just like kind of pushing the time that I have. Yeah. Start a new cycle. Just by starting the new cycle, you are deloading. And they feel refreshing. I they can do. tell you that. They do. That's I mean, new cycles are like a new like a new semester. Yeah. You know, new chances, new grades, everything. Let's do this again. <laughs> yeah, and you know, it's like we're not starting off with necessarily all five or six sets. Um, you may start off with three or four, but that's enough. You also you don't have any of the extra rest pause reps. You're down at the bottom of your chosen rep range. And, uh, you know, you've, you've basically cut your volume in half without intentionally doing so. Even though you've raised the weight a little bit, overall, you're actually doing a lot less work. And yet you're still in a zone where you're going to be making good gains. And that's the, that's the key, is that we're just staying in that range of optimal adaptation. That's just well, what, what about is. What about people taking too many deloads? Is that possible? If you take a deload wait, every wait, week. Yeah, yeah, basically. So would you... Mm -hmm. oh, wait, uh, never mind. Actually. Yeah, if you, if you never get out of <laughs> yeah, your deload, was... then you messed up. If your deloads you are up, taking yeah. a third of your time, then you're probably <laughs> screwing up your programming and you need a better coach. Everyday deload week. <laughs> you know? It's, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, you're asking questions that at some point, like, yeah, there is definitely a such thing as deloading too often. Like, But if you're programming your your cycles correctly, then that'll never happen to you. Um, yeah. There are definitely athletes that uh, eventually get to a point in certain things, especially in bodybuilding, to where they may have to take like every third or fourth week and cut the volume in half uh, just to give their body a chance to rest because their one and only goal is to get as beefcake as possible. And uh, that's they're, they're riding the line. They're basically riding that very small area between the maximum adaptive volume and the maximum recoverable, and they they often go past it. For performance yeah. athletes, um, it's a little bit different. It's a little harder to do that. They they can still make that mistake. High end power lifters can do that, um, and so you will often see some slightly shorter cycles come in, where they'll say you'll notice that a lot of these high end power lifters do two to four week mini waves. And um, that's because they are so close to their limits and are riding such a small line that it's the only way they can kind of do it safely because there is no objective thing to just look at and say, oh, we're good. We're not really sure. And so the only way to keep them safe is, is to kind of switch above and below in a very tight line. Whereas for us, we can do like this. 
It doesn't, we don't have to do this just to ride a line. Our area is still so wide that that doesn't matter. And um, I think that honestly, for most of the gymnastic strength goals that people have, I don't know that you ever really get to a point where um, you, you know, you need to get that nitty gritty. I just don't think that, I don't think it requires that. Um, You know, there may be certain people at certain points who are just like not really meant for something that want to do it anyway and may technically be capable. They might have to do that, but then is it worth their time? I don't know. Uh, they're, and they're going to have to have somebody overseeing them. That's not something that there are tools for um, at this point in time. You know, there's stuff that's being worked on. It'll eventually be there, but that's a tough one. But yeah, yeah. just just if you're following the lab coat programming, then uh, you're you're really not going to run into that scenario. You know, and you always have the lab to come to. And to say, hey, I'm starting to feel run down. It's been this long. Here's what I've been doing. You know, and here's the thing. If what you're doing is different than what we told you to do, you fucked up. I'm sorry. Just is what it is. <laughs> like, we're sitting here trying to take you to the promised land. The shit works. It's not very difficult. And, uh, you know, if you're nervous and you're not willing to trust the people that you're paying, then uh, you're, you're kind of spending your money wrong. You know, and that's yeah. not, it's nothing, it's not, it's not your fault. I'm just saying like, it's, you got to do something to figure out why that's happening because you're, you know, it's just like the person who keeps sanding something until there's a hole in the floor. Like you got to, you got to know your limits. You got to just trust when somebody says it's good and yeah. just see what happens. Just follow the recipe. Just try it out. You're not, see, a, you're not a cordon bleu chef. What are you doing trying to make the sauce from scrap? Doesn't make sense. You get a recipe that's highly rated, you follow it, you enjoy the food. And it's really kind of the same thing. It takes a long time to become a chef. So for a while, you got you to trust something, see it through, and slowly figure out what you need. That's another part of what we do is that over the course of you know, the first 6 to 12 months, a lot of this is uh, learning what you need. It is... It is made for each of you to be able to learn how to personalize the rep ranges and the volume increases and things like that so that you do what you need. That's that's why we have things set up the way that we do. All right, moving on to the next question by Matthew Miller. He asks, when doing a ton of cardio in a fat loss phase, because I simply enjoy the cardio, what is a good, a good rule of thumb for the minimum amount of work you should give your muscles in order to simply preserve their current state? The goal is sheer fat loss without losing muscle. That is hard. You're going to have a cap on the amount of cardio you can do without losing muscle, and I don't know what yours is. I used to be Wait, able to I... run for an hour a day, five, six days a week, and do other cardio stuff, and I was still working out for an hour and a half a day because I was in the middle of the ocean, and my body <laughs> let me do that. And you know what? I didn't make strength gains at all. I didn't really get, like much weaker but i didn't get any stronger and i did that a lot because i was trying to get back into buds and i didn't realize that my shoulder just wasn't in my future um so i mean i've taken that to as far of an extreme as my body can handle and uh, i know what my genetics will allow but everybody's different you'll read about people and this is true where even people who are like you know 180 pounds squatting 300 pounds their squat starts dropping when they start running um, and, and they can't, there's nothing they can do about that. And they notice that their muscle mass changes. And so there's two problems there. One, they are probably not accounting for the extra energy that the cardio requires. When you do cardio, it costs a lot more energy than working out for an hour. So like if we're lifting weights and we're doing some typical mass training or strength training, we're burning somewhere in the neighborhood of four to six times basal metabolic rate. If you're yeah. jogging at like uh, a 10 minute mile, which is not very fast, you're burning double that. So even though you'll, you'll, you're, you feel like you're working harder during the strength training, and you're like, man, I lifted and I did all this stuff and I planched. <laughs> You kind of got to still realize, you know what I'm saying? I <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying, you know, it's uh, it's a little counterintuitive, but we know we know what costs what, and so the, 
You just but have can to I, account for the work something? you're doing. What if, what if That's you the biggest thing, and you got to get enough, enough protein, and you've got to do your strength training. You basically keep training exactly like you're trying to gain mass. Like for the strength side. That's really what you have to do. And um, you can't drop down the maintenance volume. You know, you, you really do kind of need to keep your lifting moving pretty well. You can drop it down to like, you know, twice a week frequency and uh, just hit big movements like one overhead press, one horizontal press, and like, you know, one horizontal row or one horizontal or one vertical row and just like alternate weeks between like these planes and like you're hitting the muscles. It's good. Your goal is not to stay strong. You're just trying to preserve as much mass as you can, right? So mm -hmm. I think that if you, you know, you, you may, it's all, that's, those are the those are the bottom lines. You still need to stay in your mass and strength zone. So minimum of like sixty to seventy percent one rep max. You might even feel you may you might even find that you do better if you go a little heavier. And then uh, you've got to manage your calorie deficit, and you've got to get enough protein, like three grams per kilo. And uh, if you do those three things, you're generally going to lose almost nothing but body fat. Um, that's really the key. And you're going to, so the muscle mass that you gained is going to come right back. It's going to come back in the first couple of weeks of training because you've already had the long-term effects of recruiting new myonuclei. So you already have kind of the protein factories in place. So you grow like six, 10 times faster during a regrowth <coughs> phase than you do the first time around, unless you're on steroids. So the, um, you know, that's, that's kind of the thing you want to lose cool. fat and keep your muscle don't cut, don't do, it's not, a, it, part of it is a cardio thing because it's an epigenetic regulator, but the other part, it, and I'm glossing that over, I'm not going there. Um, no, don't go there, don't go there, we don't have time for that. Yeah, but <laughs> the, um, it changes gene expression, um, and it, you'll have knockouts that, that literally prevent um, type 2A and, and type 2X yeah, uh, yeah, heavy yeah, yeah, chains yeah. From, from reaching the ribosomes and blah, blah, blah. So, the um so there are things that happen right but you keep it simple do your cardio do like 30 minutes an hour a couple times a week burn your calories on just make sure that you are not doing more than like a 30 40 percent calorie deficit make sure that you're getting your protein and you'll be all right you really will focus just make sure you have great fat loss make sure you're working every muscle in your body twice a week don't do a bunch of isolation work. Do like your pull-ups and your bench press or your planche push-ups and, you know, your overhead press and um, your squats and your deadlifts and call it a day. Like, you got you to gotta super simplify so that you have the time for the cardio. That's, that's kind of key. Like, swap workouts between I'm doing regular squats this time, I'm doing split squats next time, and I just go back and forth. You know, so you so you basically, during the course of the week, you're working these muscles, slightly different emphasis. You feel like you're doing more and you you will retain you'll retain the mass and you'll be happier about all your overall results <clears throat> all right cool moving on to the next question three more questions left uh by mero gomez alvarez can't get more american than that <laughs> is are there any advantages in the order of main of the main exercises listed in the program that's a great um, question what yeah do you think? so so what I think is, yeah, there, there is a there are advantages. For example, if you do a horizontal pull first, you know, and then you move on to your vertical pull. So you do some rows and then you do some pull ups. Your pull ups aren't going to be that great, but it, all the way around, it's, it's okay. You won't have that much uh, issues the other way around. Um, That's definitely been my experience. Yeah, and so what I do, yeah, if, I, if it's I'll, different for somebody than whatever, but. I think that that's more common. Yeah, it, but just find yeah. find out what works for you. For me, I pair exercises to, to you know, for for efficiency wise. So I always pair a uh, horizontal press with vertical pull, and then I pair a uh, vertical. What, what did I say? Vertical push with horizontal pull. That's what I do. That's just me because I like doing it like that. And then mm -hmm. after that, I do my accessory work. Uh, just find out what works for you, and um, yeah, that's that's the answer, man. Yeah, I, I think that the one thing that is important is to keep the overhead press at the top of the list. It should be the first thing that you do. 
And the reason oh. is that it's where most of you have the most to gain. Okay. A lot of people don't understand that the overhead press is probably the single biggest contributor to long-term planche progress. Uh, I think it, you know, you can argue, and it's like there's 10 different ways to slice this up. There's already people who are going to, you know, say, oh, my God, you're such an idiot. It's obviously the weighted push-ups or the pseudo planche push-ups or the L-sit slide to planche lean and blah, 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 blah. Look, what you need is good training for all of the scapular stabilizers and upward rotators and protractors. And that means overhead press because the overhead press, especially in the top half of the movement, trains a part of the serratus anterior that really doesn't get worked in anything else. Not very well. The fibers are in a different orientation. And when mm -hmm. you start doing the overhead press right, you actually feel something different kind of high up in your armpit. And, um, that is, it, 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 it trains, it gives you a very easy way to get good volume with steady intensity and no risk of falling on your head. So you can train it a lot, do it with decent form, and really work on everything from your shoulders to your triceps. But more importantly, serratus anterior is hugely, hugely challenged. And you also get a lot of great work for the upper traps and lower traps for stabilization. The upper traps are actually a big part of the overhead press. And so this combination is basically what you need for stabilization during a lot of gymnastic movements. So the overhead press is very, very underrated. I definitely think that um, that, should, that can and should include headstand and handstand push-ups too. But there are. I mean, there's 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 another reason for that because you're just gonna be tired. Right. It's gonna be harder to balance if you do your hands to push up at the end of a workout. Right. Trust me, I tried. <laughs> it is, and, and the other thing is like your balance is gonna limit your ability to do the um, handstand push-ups. Um, and it takes a long time to get strong enough to get sufficient volume, even on wall variants. You know, that's just a long yeah. road, and so it, you're, there's a lot of advantages to using free weight overhead presses, especially in the beginning of your training career. When you get strong enough to where you can get good volume with the body weight versions, then I think it's kind of potato, potato. You do what you like. But, yeah. um, and I think there will always be some, there will be a place for the uh, overhead press, although it may end up going more to an accessory movement for the barbell dumbbell stuff uh, as you get stronger. But in the beginning, it's primary because it's your best way to get, uh, sustainable, regular increases that get you where you need to go. So that, that's why I would keep it first. Um, unless for some reason you are just an absurdly strong overhead presser and everything else is behind you. And Which you're like, that would be if we had a professional Olympic lifter who okay, yeah. came into the program and you know said you know what i'd like to strong this i'm going to be honest with you i don't think they need very much overhead press if they are jerking you know two three times their body weight and able to hold that overhead there i can guarantee you 100 percent those guys are going to rep out their body weight and overhead press like it's nobody's business they're going to have handstand push-ups almost immediately and i don't mean headstand push-ups i mean handstand uh, push-ups like, like from the shoulders bam. It's but, not going to take them very long, and it's not going to bother them. So they don't; they, their priorities would be different. But unless yeah, you're one of those people, keep it how it is. Have the overhead press first. The rest of it, you arrange what works for you. Some people will like doing all the one exercises. Some will like pairs. I've always been an exercise pair guy for the most part. Me but, too. But you know, you you got to do. That's just flavoring. Yeah. That's just yeah. Just get the work in. Yeah. Exactly. All right, moving on to the next question by Roy Bazil. We know this guy. Yeah. What do you think about taking creatine and its link to increasing DHT, thus causing more mill pattern uh, baldness? I want to start supplementing it, but I'm afraid I will just make my receding hairline even worse than it already is. If you Does the research support this? <laughs> I have, that is, I'm going to be honest with you. That's the first time I have ever heard that. Um... I don't know. <laughs> I have I've literally never... never, ever heard that. So I am... You're going to look it up now? PubMed creatine baldness. He's looking it up right now. He's looking it up right now for you guys. 
<sighs> this is how I do things, man. You just, you just gotta, you just gotta look it up. Is it true? Yeah, like this is this is. Okay. I'm curious. Let me turn on I, the light I, in my room. <laughs> I don't want to miss out though. I, I just don't think that this is worth worrying about. Um, well, just give me a second. I'll be right back. All right, I'm back. Oh, it's still dark in my room. Yeah, you're just... So the, the problem with people who have male pattern baldness is they have a variant in androgen receptor. Okay? And okay. Um, <laughs> for whatever reason, it, it ends up essentially causing hair follicles to go dormant and die. Um, and so they don't come back. Um eventually so, so does make creating worse no dude okay look it's you're talking about so you got to realize that what's happening here basically is um that you're basically looking at a ratio of dht to testosterone changing dht is a much more powerful androgen um mm -hmm. <laughs> there is I, here's what i will tell you okay there are no okay. articles on this that i can find after like just what, what i'm what i'm looking yeah. at there, this is not this is not have a pile of evidence on it and um that's usually your first sign that there is not a lot of good data to make a uh Claim, but I can tell you this: if there was something strong to this, first off, it would be an issue that you'd be hearing about from people who are like, "Damn it, creatine made me go bald." Creatine didn't make you go bald. Your maternal grandfather made you go bald. Blame him. Um, <laughs> I'm just saying. You know what I mean? Like, it's just. Yeah, like when I search for creatine baldness and I start getting anti-melanoma differentiated associated gene 5 and unsuccessful treatment of alopecia with simvastatin and all this stuff, and I don't see anything at all new talking about these two paired keywords in PubMed, I do not think that you need to be worrying about this. I'm, I'm just saying this is a very strong indication that the evidence was weak that it did not really go anywhere and um, that your mileage may vary, but there is, it is definitely not going to like randomly make people go bald. Um, if you okay. already have male pattern baldness, you're not going to keep yourself from going bald unless you're using like, uh, was it like minoxidil and um, other stuff? And you, you'll have to pay attention. You know, I don't know what to tell you. You know, there's going to be outliers, but um, I don't see anything that I can force myself to be concerned about. I, I, Should we move on to the next question then? <laughs> the last question? Yeah, I'm not saying that, it, it, again, I mean, I'm not, I'm not telling you that it might not happen, but yeah, the, <laughs> the last published study was <laughs> 10 years ago. I mean, I'm sorry. That didn't, it didn't lead anywhere. It was a question and they had at best like, a few more questions about it and it just didn't really go anywhere. So I, no, I don't think that it's a thing. Um, you know, there are people who may have individual experiences that are different, but there's nothing that's going to keep you from going bald. If you were born with the genetics to go bald, you know, except for like go hair transplants. I mean, yeah, that obviously works. Um, and wigs, but there's nothing wrong with being bald. If you can pull it off, dude. You just got to own it. You just got to own it. Yeah. Okay, moving on to the next question. The last question, I'm actually very impressed by us, you know, answering this many questions. Uh, this question is from Ansi Libak. And he asks, would you please share your recommendations for long-term knee health? 
I have medial meniscus tears in both knees, and osteoarthritis is prevalent in my family. Jeez. <sighs> that that sounds... It's okay, so once you have meniscal tears, um, there is an increased prevalence of osteoarthritis later, and your family has it going on anyways. Your best protection against osteoarthritis in general is maintaining a healthy body weight and not hitting your knee with hammers. Um, so, and, and not turning it into a um, uh, mortar and pestle. So you don't want to do this inside your knee, which means you want to have good form on your squats, good form on your deadlifts. I would probably stay away from doing things like uh, rolling squats and, th you know, um, I, w I think that that's an, a massive unnecessary risk for you. But did he say that he had pain or just pain? that he has injuries? I don't know. He's actually one of the uh, consultant people. Well, uh, I don't know anything about his history, so um, that's a yeah. hard one to answer. Here's what I can tell you. With people like that, I would always use knee wraps, 100%. Uh, I think you've got to be Good point. very, very stupid not to because the knee wrap doesn't really do much of any work for you. You know, that, that elastic in there is good for me, it would, especially when you use them right in the way that I'll show you. Uh, yeah, I don't think he has pain. He doesn't mention any pain. If he doesn't have pain and he doesn't have popping, then I don't think that he has anything to worry about outside of whatever his genetics and uh, body mass predispose him to. Okay. But um, he, I think that it becomes very important for him to do a combination of single and double leg squats, and I think that it becomes very important for him to wear knee wraps during that work. And, and he needs to see how running treats him. He may be better with, uh, that may be fine. It may be a problem for him. Uh, you know, so how he gets his cardio, if he chooses to do cardio, maybe something he may not want to be on a rowing machine where he goes into a lot of knee flexion because that can sometimes aggravate the meniscus stuff. Um, I think that he is probably a bad idea for him to do certain, uh, knee things that a healthy knee can do, uh, like the inside and outside squats. Um, so... I would stick to basics, you know, take care of yourself. Don't jump out of planes. Don't twist your knee and um, use good form on your squat stuff and make sure that you're using knee wraps during it. I think yeah, that if you cover your bases there, you'd be all right. Or as all right cool. as you can be, you know, there's no guarantees. I have a lateral meniscus tear in my right yeah, knee. Yeah, because you, you had lateral, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's very irritating. There's stuff that I can't do. It hurts. My body won't put up with running for more than like a minute, which pisses me off because I love running and I'm fast. And I love being fast because I'm also big. And so people are like, holy crap, he should not be able to <laughs> run like that. And now I can't show off at something I'm good at. And oh, I'm not going to lie, sucks, it hurts me a little bit, you know, it really does, but that's life. I can still jump rope. That doesn't bother me. Um, jumping rope is a lot of fun. I really like it. I also don't have I have healthy knees it. and I can't do that. <laughs> I, I just can't do it. I have yeah. never practiced it. Yeah. I mean, you know, everybody's different <laughs> and, uh, listen, <laughs> jumping rope will piss you off for at least the first week that you're doing it. It is an acquired skill. And along the way, there is a lot of frustration. Uh, but yeah. then once you're good at it, people are like, whoa, that's kind of cool. I'm not a cardio guy. I have a hard time getting my calories in eight away, so <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. You, you got to start buying a lot of ice cream once you start doing a lot of cardio. This is what yeah, it is. Yeah, no, see, see, I don't want to do yeah. that. I'm, I'm fine the way I am now. <laughs> yeah. Okay? Anyway, let's wrap this up because we answered every question, dude. Well done. Like, yeah, that's a clap for us. Like I'm, I'm proud of us because th this was like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen questions. What? One podcast with Joshua Naderman. How is that even possible? How did you do it? Tell me your secrets. Like what's what's going? What's happening? I didn't. Here? I think y'all drugged me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hey, uh, we better wrap this up then. Uh, <laughs> no, um, guys, thank you for sending your questions. We hope you liked this episode. I sure did. And um, keep sending them in. 
And stay tuned for plenty more podcasts in the future. Have a good right one. On. See you guys.